I am Geoffrey Villard Wen, back in the Middle Ages in the Empire of the Romans, and Alexius Comnenus Ducas has marched on Arta and put it under siege. Unfortunately there he was prized by the local general Gabriel Archontopoulos, who had rebelled against the Emperor. Archontopoulos is at the head of a very large army, double the size of our own. Alexius Comnenus Ducas is forced to lift the siege of Arta and retreat ignominiously back to Corinth. He vows to return to Arta with such an army that the earth will tremble. Our diplomat, Matthäus Contralistus, has reached the kingdom of Jerusalem. He secures a trade agreement, but the Crusaders refuse an alliance. There will come a time when they will be begging for our help. Back in Corinth, Alexius Comnenus Ducas commissions the building of an inn, for which he receives from the local wine merchants a gift of a thousand golden coins. The Tunisian Emir is dead. Our garrisons have been strengthened everywhere. Nicaea has now a grain exchange. Nikiforus Brianius is now a Merakis, the commander of three brigades. That would make him Marshal of the East. He has hired an architect to rebuild the Sinope. The Turks are the strongest faction. We are already in the year of 1104. The normal Admiral Antonio has been cornered in the Gulf of Corinth by the Venetian fleet. Admiral Nicephorus chanced to be in the area preparing for the next expedition to Arta. He attacks the Normans and sinks their fleet. Egypt has sent an embassy to negotiate trade rights, which are agreed upon. Our garrisons are being strengthened. The land clearance projects in Smyrna and Adrianople have been completed, and Handax has a small Orthodox church. The Moors are now the most advanced faction, but the Empire of the Romans is militarily the strongest. Our diplomats have failed to find a suitable bride for our co-emperor, even in the courts of the Latins in Italy and the Levant. So Prince Ioannes Comnenus accepts the hand of a noble lady in marriage. On to the year 1105 and Baris gets a chapel. Eustathius Lampinus and Constantinus Angelos are now both Drungari, that is, admirals. Simbasilius Ioannis rises to the rank of brigadier, perhaps he is now the marshal of the imperial army, currently campaigning in Asia under Nikiforus Briennius. The Empire has no other field army. Our diplomat Theophanes Coco Basilius has reached Odessa in the land of the Kievan Rus, and there he negotiates a trade agreement and an alliance with the Russians. The Russians are quick to accept our proposals, and so we gain another ally and trade partner. Relations are now on very good terms. The Pope also agrees to trade rights. Our economic union extends from Europe almost to the Caspian Sea and would be the envy of the EU. An Norman fleet blockades the port of Handax. Admiral Nicephorus sails out of the harbour with his fleet and sinks the full hardy Normans. Nicolaus Grammaticus was the patriarch of Constantinople in real history, but here he is still only a bishop, touring the empire, spreading the word of the gospel. He is accompanied by his chosen one, Bishop Timotheus, a very worthy man of God. 
and on to the year 1106, a good year in which a variety of useful construction projects were completed across the empire. We are no longer the best in anything, but still among the top factions in all that matters. Our emperor is also our greatest general, and our empire spans 14 provinces. We have three allies, Hungary, the Russians and Georgia. Genoa agrees to a trade agreement, but declines the offer of an alliance. Building queues are stalled for lack of funds. The polis, senior duke, is dead. Which must be good news for the junior duke. A priest, Andronicus Ceramius, is now in Zinope. More useful buildings are finished in the second semester of 1106. Theodorus Batagis, the son of our general Alexius Batagis, has come of age. The Moors rise above every other faction in size and might. As you will, my lord, we march to battle. Besieging settlement, my lord. They're going nowhere, my lord. The siege continues. Alexius Comnenus Ducas did what he promised and returned to Arta with a mighty army under the overall command of Georgius Paleologus. The army is mighty in numbers but has mostly levies borrowed from the various garrisons of the west. On the other hand, the rebels of Arta have no better units. Arta is again put under siege. Theodorus Batagis has come of age in Constantinople, a very lucky thing as he can acquire there the education suitable to a young member of the imperial family circle. Our diplomat Marianos Prokopis chances eventually upon an unmarried princess, Constance Capet of France, unfortunately too late for our prince. The French princess agrees to trade rights. Eustathius Lampinos takes a part of the garrison of Constantia in Cyprus and lands on the coast of Silesia. The day is ours! The enemy are beaten! Noble lord, we have conquered! There he captures the fort of Adana a wonderfully fortified city in stainless steel, but sadly only a small fort in titanium. Our priests begin to gather between Zenopi and Rebizond on a mission to Christianize the Turks. The rebel general Gabriel Archontopoulos, seeing the massive army of Georgius Paleologos and Alexius Komnenos Ducas that has invested Arta, retreats to the fort of Hypatos. Our marshal of the east, Nikiforus Bryennius, marches to Sebastia, another city lost to the empire, and puts it under siege. Sebastia was an ancient city in Cappadocia. Once the capital of Armenia Minor, it had been a bastion of the eastern frontier of the empire. Cappadocia itself had been a bastion of another kind, a bastion of Christianity. Three early saints, among the most important fathers of the church, had lived here. Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, and Basil the Great, the founder of Christian monasticism. Sebastia itself was known as the place of martyrdom of 40 Christian martyrs in the early days before the Roman Empire had embraced Christianity. The moment has come to reclaim the city for the Empire. A Turkish army chances by during the siege, but they do not come to the help of the rebels. Men, bring our people honor, glory, a 
and most of all, victory! Bryennius commands the Imperial Army. He gives his orders, and our soldiers move to the walls with their siege rams and siege towers. Here is our glorious Marshal of the East, the Merarchis, Nikiphorus Briennius, the Caesar, a title he bore in real history, one of the titles given to senior members of the Imperial household just a step down from being a co-emperor. He was, of course, married to the daughter of the Emperor, Anna Komnen. Sebastia has followed the example of Zinopin in building a wall of wood to stop the sheep and chicken from escaping. And here are our siphonators, our flamethrowers carrying some ladders. Bizarrely, they could not fire their flamethrowers at the wooden walls of Sebastia. They could have managed if there was an enemy unit behind the wall, but there was nobody inside Sebastia save for the Turkish governor, Abu Hamid, and his bodyguard in the town plaza. The battering ram is in place. It will not be long before our enemy's defenses fall. Our men have reached the walls with their ladders. So are Siphonatorus unable to make their flamethrowers pure fire out the wooden walls, went back to the ladders and just climbed up the wall with scarcely more effort. Give grace to God! We have captured the enemy's walls! The walls fell, and our men entered leisurely through the gate and headed for the central square to negotiate the surrender of the castle. Here is the enemy general, the governor of Sebastia Abu Hamid, with his bodyguard in the town plaza and our glorious army parading inside the city. Our infantry is approaching the plaza, and we have some very special units here the Imperial Guard, we have the Varangian Guard. Saxon X-Men, we have the Spathari of the Emperor Swordsmen, and among them we have this very special unit, the Siphon Atomus. The enemy general is hesitating but makes his decision to charge the Siphon Atomus.
fatal decision to say the least. Only half the enemy force remains. It is unwise to praise the day before sunset, but our men are winning the battle and forging a worthy victory. And so that decided the fate of Sebastian. To his credit, the enemy general keeps fighting along with his ensign, but the resistance is not made. Nikiforus Briennius comes with his bodyguard and charges the flank of the enemy general. The Saracen general retreats into the town plaza. This is a negotiation of sorts. Quite clearly, surrender is not his only option. He is bloodied but keeps fighting Excellent. on. Our men have taken control of the castle. More of a cavalry appears from the side street. The Saracen general retreats once again into the town plaza. Now there he is, perhaps he's made up his mind to surrender. running out of arguments. It should have been a mechanic to give the option for the defenders to surrender and so he's slain. We are blessed. The enemy general is dead. We have sent the idiot to hell. Abu Hamid has fallen. This is a clear victory that goes to only men of great virtue and Nikiforus Briennius is victorious. Our enemy has been defeated. And Sebastia is now once again part of the Roman Empire. Thank you for watching.